what is Sea Shepherd and what's your role in it? Well, I uh, founded the organization in 1977 as a, an anti-poaching organization. So what we what we do is we go after illegal activities, uh, primarily on the high seas, but in recent years we've formed partnerships with numerous governments to work in their territory. And why direct action as opposed to other types of ways to stop? Well, you know, the, the strength of an ecosystem is... Uh, is diversity, and therefore the strength of any movement is diversity. So there's certainly room for education, legislation, litigation, and direct action, and that's the part that we do. We're really what we do is enforcement. Uh, there are uh, we have all the laws and regulations and treaties we need uh, to protect our oceans. But the problem is there's a lack of a political and economic motivation on the part of government to uphold the law. So that's what we're doing. I mean, we'd stop what we're doing tomorrow if the government should step up to the plate and do their job. Are there times, though, when the government say, hey, you know, leave it to us and, and back off? No, no, really. Uh, there, uh, right now we have partnerships, especially in Africa, doing anti-poaching campaigns. So we're partnered with Liberia, San Tome, Cape Verde, uh, Tanzania, Namibia, Gabon, Benin, uh, and, uh, to and Togo. And uh, we're forming new partnerships all the time. What that means is we go into their waters, we're carrying their enforcement people on board. And uh, so that gives us the authority to intervene. We have resources, they have the authority, and that's working really well. We also have partnerships with Mexico, uh, Costa Rica, Peru, and Ecuador. Uh, our partnership began actually in Ecuador, protecting the Galapagos in 1999, going 20 years ago. And but now, when they go out beyond the 200 mile limits, then that's international waters. Then our authority is with uh, lies with the United Nations World Charter for Nature, which allows for non-government organizations and individuals to uphold international conservation law. And I've used that quite effectively in court cases that we, we've been involved in. So we're not really a vigilante group in that respect. I mean, we do operate with you know, you know, the foundation of law. We operate within the boundaries of practicality and the boundaries of the law. What should people think about when they think about conservation in Florida and what is your organization involved in? Well, I think what's uh, most important in Florida is protecting uh, marine ecosystems, especially from uh, agricultural runoff. Uh, and, and, and also you have um, overfishing is a real problem. I think that uh, on the positive side in Florida is Florida fish and wildlife is, are, are pretty good at enforcing the laws. And the same with other states like Alaska, California. They're very, very good on that. We don't, we don't have to get involved in that. But activists do need to get involved in things that, uh, and, and probably more on a political, educational level when you're talking about agriculture. Because there, what we're dealing with is really legal problems, legal corporations that they're causing problems. And there are laws being broken, but uh, it's a completely different thing when you're working on land as opposed to working uh, on the sea. But really what I try to get people to do is to understand the one basic thing that we're all about, and that is if the ocean dies, we all die, and the ocean is dying. And it's being affected by numerous issues, everything from climate change, to acidification, to uh, pollution from uh, radiation, from chemicals, from sonar pollution. All of these things are causing massive uh, diminishment in, in biodiversity. And um, for instance, uh, since 1950, we've had a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton populations in the world's oceans. Phytoplankton provides 70% of the oxygen in the air we breathe. If phytoplankton goes extinct, we all die. And that's how, how serious this problem is. So we try to get people to understand that their very survival, no matter where you live, your very survival depends on having a healthy uh, Sea turtles, I noticed that, in, that sea turtle, endangered sea turtles is something that your organization is concerned about. We have several species here in Florida. What can people learn about sea turtles? We have a, a campaign called Operation Hyro. It's named after Hyro Sandoval, who was a 26-year-old who was murdered in Costa Rica for protecting turtles. And that campaign goes around the world. So we're here in Florida working on it, Nicaragua, Honduras, Colombia, Ecuador, and uh, Cape Verde. And uh, we have a crew right now in the island of Mayon. That's a little island in Madagascar, I want to speak, and intervening uh, to stop the poachers from killing the turtles on the beaches. That usually involves uh, night patrols camping out on the beaches. And, that. Uh, and it's been very, very effective. In Florida, what we concentrate on is trying to stop uh, uh, lights from hotels and stores oh, and from uh, keeping the, the drawing.
keep the turtles, the baby turtles away yeah, because they, you know, they go towards the light. So we're trying to, to work with the community to try and get that light, that light pollution down. The gender of a turtle, a baby turtle, is often determined in large part by the temperature of the sand that's it's incubated. And as the earth is warming, uh, that certainly could affect sea turtle populations. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, here's a species that's been around really for millions of years, and uh, you know, could disappear in our lifetime. Uh, and climate change could be a major factor on that. So then, it really requires a lot of research. Of, you know, how we can maybe there's a way of cooling it down. I don't know. Uh, but right now, what we're trying to do is keeping them from being their eggs from being taken by by poachers. Uh, in places like Montreal, we also have to keep them from being killed directly for their meat. Well, like, it impacts shellfish and, uh, you know, it really weakens and deteriorates the, the shells on that. So it's, it, that's a major problem. And, uh, and of, course, of course, it affects uh, habitat, like where, uh, which involves where the fish are, where they migrate to, where, they, where they're coming from. Uh, so it is, it is a major problem. One of the problems that uh, people don't really talk about much, but I find to be one of the, the most uh, threatening ones, is sonic pollution. That is the noises uh, in the ocean, which disrupt not just whales and dolphins, which we've really heard of, but also uh, disrupts the uh, activ activities and behavior of many, many uh, species uh, in, in the ocean. And the ocean was now a noisy place, where, you know, generations ago, it was a relatively quiet place. It was noisy in the sense that, you know, you could hear the animals communicating, but now the animals can't communicate because of our interventions. I think a lot of people understand your organization when it comes to protecting individual animals or groups of animals, but you're also focused on habitat protection. How, how, did, how does your group do that? Well, I have already mentioned the, the coral propagation and carabasti. Uh, one of the things that we're working on doing right now is using drones to uh, drop um, uh, trees into the urban areas. Of the urban areas of the and uh, to try and uh, encourage that because they're great buffers against hurricanes. We've been very much involved in the hurricane issues. We started uh, a couple of years ago with Hurricane Maria, and uh, we were the, the first to Dominica to bring relief supplies and to work with them. And uh, we just spent the last two months uh, in the Bahamas uh, rescuing animals and people, bringing relief supplies. And we just finished up that project this week by uh, building a solar power station for Sweetwater Key uh, in one of the uh, upper northern islands. So we're go we're going to be doing more and more of that because the hurricanes are going to become stronger and stronger. And uh, what that does is it, it also builds a good relationship with those governments and those other kind of people on that, which helps uh, in our other areas, protecting sharks or whatever. So you know, we want to show that we're very concerned about people yeah. and their habitats too, as well as marine species. Talk a little bit more about some of the efforts after the hurricanes either in what does it look like right after the hurricane there? And, uh, what are the things that people most need? Well, uh, in the Bahamas, what we found was, first of all, we had to deal with the bureaucracy. We got there, it took us 48 hours to clear customs, bringing relief supplies, and people need it, but you know, the bureaucracy gets in the way. But we were able to get them uh, to, to get water, medical supplies, tents, and things to, to those most hardest hit islands, and then also to uh, do water filtration uh, kits and, and solar power to bring so they can restore uh, power. We also rescued a lot of dogs and cats, which were left stranded by that. It's really hard to describe what was there. Uh, I mean, you're looking at islands which were so flooded that people were probably looking at their community.
communities being four to five feet underwater, and you know people were hiding in the attics or whatever. So, yeah, it was devastating. A lot of bodies were already found because they just lost them. I think people in Florida should be uh, indebted to the people in the Bahamas because the Bahamas basically saved Florida. That storm was stopped right yeah. in its tracks by the Bahamas. But it's going to happen here, and uh, yeah, we have to be prepared for more stronger and stronger storms. In the and it's not just uh, hurricanes here, but it's also tropical storms uh, on the Pacific side and, and, and more severe weather conditions. And climate change is a reality. And, uh, you know, it's not a quite, people can deny it all they want, but it's not going to change the fact that it's happening. The Fen Conserve Protect is the name of a new film. What can people expect if they see this film, and uh, what kind of story does it tell? Uh, that film was narrated by Dan Aykroyd, and that covers our campaigns down in the Southern Ocean to protect uh, whales, which is a very successful campaign. The Japanese retreated from the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary this year for good, uh, and now for the first time it's totally protected. In fact, this year marks the first time in the history of whaling that no whales will be killed in international waters anywhere. All whaling now is restricted to the territorial waters of Norway, which is the largest whale killing nation now, Japan second. So Norway, Japan, Iceland, and Denmark. And we're working on trying to stop it there. But it's a great achievement this year to see that uh, whaling is no longer taking place in, in international waters. We saved about 6,500 whales in the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary, and that's what this what that film is about. We had a film that just uh, was aired last night on, uh, on National Geographic, uh, Sea of Shadows, and that covers our campaign in the Sea of Cortez to uh, protect the highly endangered Bikita porpoise, which I'm convinced would now be extinct if it wasn't for the last five years of our interventions. We've saved, we, we've confiscated 950 nets, about 150,000 meters in nets in total, and uh, we're pulling those nets out of the Bikita refuge as fast as they get them in there, and I think that's the key to the survival of the Bikita, is to, is to keep that vigilance on there all through that period of time. So from now, uh, in October, until uh, June, we're permanently there. We have three ships dedicated to just pulling nets and, and chasing poachers out of that area. Uh, there's another film that's uh, out of the uh, airing on uh, Discovery on December 12th, uh, and that's called Watson by Leslie Chilcott, who made a film about myself. Uh, she was the woman who made a film about uh, Inconvenient Truth of Al Gore. And so she's done a wonderful job. Uh, a lot of our listeners might not know the story of this porpoise in the Sea of Cortez. Uh, why are the nets there? What's, what, is it, what is this porpoise that used to harvest it for illegally? And uh, what, what can you tell us about the recovery? The Paquita is the most endangered and smallest porpoise in the world. And they're not targeting the Paquita. They're targeting a fish called the Totoa, which is about the same size as the Paquita, so it gets caught, the Paquita gets caught in the Totoa nets. But the Totoa is also an endangered species. And the reason they're going after the totoaba is the swim bladder of the totoaba is worth twenty thousand dollars a kilo in China. And so with that kind of price on its head, the cartels are involved in it. We're fighting the cartels out there. We've had Molotov cocktails thrown at us, we're shot at all the time, the drones are shot out of the sky. It's a very, very violent situation. We have not had anybody injured, but uh, on board we have Mexican sailors, who, uh, you know, Navy people who are there and they're off. I've always felt the, the most powerful weapon is, is the camera, so we have a lot of those. But uh, the Bikita porpoise uh, could go extinct because of this in incredible demand for uh, uh, for, for totoaba. So it's um, the, the black market between Mexico and China is pretty significant. We're working on the water to stop it. Uh, Earth Action League is working on land to try and inter intervene against the smuggling operations. I want to talk more about your victory in, in the Southern Ocean for whaling, if you don't mind. Um, how did you get Japan on board, and what makes you think that they are going to abide by not whaling in the Southern Ocean? Well, we didn't get them on board at all. What happened is that we, we cost them over $150 million in losses. We cut down their quotas every year from 30% down to 10%. One time they only got 10% in uh, 2000. 13. And uh, it, it cost them a lot of money. And uh, so much so that it got to the point they were going to have to replace their, their factory ship. And they don't have the political support in Japan any longer to do that. That's about a $200 million investment. And they just don't have the support. So we beat the mechanism on that. Uh, now, I'm not really interfering with them right now for their territorial 
whaling because everybody said well, they started commercial whaling again. Well, they never actually stopped. They just called it some research. But they've stopped it in the Southern Ocean. They're killing, they have a quota in their own waters. But they're no longer getting subsidies from the Japanese government like they were before. And without subsidies, it's not going to survive. So within four years, I believe that whaling will be finished in Japan. Now, the reason we're not going to directly intervene with them and we're focusing our attention on Iceland and Norway is because sometimes it's like in that song, you know, have to know when to hold them, you've got to know when to hold them. Sometimes you got to back off and for the Japanese to save face and to, you know, if we get involved, that'll just raise the passions of the whalers and probably uh, motivate the government to put in more subsidies just because we're Westerners that are opposing them. So these factory ships, uh, many people are familiar with them, but people are, and they would say research on the side because they're ostensibly uh, just uh, gathering animals for scientific research, but you learned differently that they weren't just being used for scientific research. You explain to people uh, that the uh, fights, I guess, these are the opposition that you got on the water. Well, in 1982, the International Whaling Commission ruled that there was uh, the global moratorium on commercial whaling, and uh, it was to take uh, effect in 1986. Well, in 1987, uh, Japan suddenly was no longer a commercial whaling nation. Now they're a research whaling nation, so they went down there to kill whales for so-called scientific research purposes. But they don't want to waste the meat, they said, so they'll sell it anyway. So it's just everybody knew it was just a bogus sort of thing. And uh, in 2014, uh, they were brought to Australia and New Zealand brought Japan before the International Court of Justice in the Hague, and uh, they, they ruled that it was illegal, and they had to stop. So they stopped for one year, but then they went back again and defied the, uh, the International Court in 2016 and 2017. And we, and we went against them again. They took us to court here in the U.S. to try and shut us down, too. So we had a lot of legal fights with them. But uh, we were just relentless. In fact, we call one of our campaign operation relentless. And we just have to be relentlessly go after them. And uh, ultimately won. I mean, the one thing I'm most proud of us all is that 6,500 whales were spared the harpoon because of our, our interventions. Now, there's a lot of uh, talk about how you know, the Japanese called us terrorists. But I don't see that at all. We're interfering with a, a grossly illegal act. So how do we do terrorists? Uh, they could say things like, well, they threw acid at us. Well, we never did. We threw rotten butter at us. It's called butyric acid. <laughs> uh, it's, in fact, Coca-Cola is less acidic than, than butyric acid. But, they, you know, the manipulation of words and things like that in the media, you know, we we'll always have to expect to be attacked like that. <clears throat> but the fact is, is, Sea Shepherd has never been convicted of, of a felony anywhere in the world. And that we never caused an injury or sustained it. And uh, in fact, a few years ago, I was invited to give a talk to the FBI in Quantico. And one of the agents said, Well, you know, Sea Shepherd's walking a pretty fine line. I said, well, uh -huh. I said, Does it really matter how fine the, uh, the line is as long as you don't actually cross the line? I couldn't really disagree with that. What's the next big campaign that maybe people aren't familiar with, haven't heard about yet? Yeah. We have 10 ships out on the ocean right now, about almost 200 volunteers are on those ships, and they're doing numerous campaigns. Uh, two of our ships are patrolling the east and west coast of Africa to go after poachers. We busted 34 poaching vessels uh, this year, uh, and uh, most importantly, that's acting as a deterrent to, to keep the other poachers out of there. So protecting Africa's coastlines is uh, what we're do doing there. One of our vessels is heading up into the Bay of Biscay to, uh, in this month to go after the, the French trawler fleets and their fly kills and dolphins and try and stop that. We're doing anti-poaching patrols in the Mediterranean and in the Caribbean. And we have one of our ships now going to work in partnership with Indonesia. And uh, so we're, we're, we're moving about all the time. It's really good when we're doing like the African campaigns uh, to move about. So we'll go into one territorial water and everybody leave and then we'll go somewhere else, but sometimes we'll double back and catch them again. I'll take a second while this goes by. Sure, a lot of sirens in this town. <laughs> so in addition also to that, we're exposing a lot of the contradictions. For instance, one of the vessels we arrested off Africa is uh, is down in the books as a sustainable fishery. You know, and they're, and they're selling the pride. Well, this is a sustainable fishery. We caught them without a license fishing in an area of not supposed to fish. The other thing that we're finding in a lot of these things is this is the last uh, real place where you'll find slavery. And a lot of these ships are, are really uh, crewed by people who are virtually slaves. They can't get off the ships or pay very little money. Uh, 
one ship that we boarded off Africa, going through the crew uh, the documentation, we found a passport. Like, Where's the crew member? And uh, of course, we brought it in because you know people get killed all the time and just throw them overboard, but they neglected to throw the passport overboard with them. And so, uh, and we've uh, been able to stop uh, bribery, for instance, another vessel. going to come right down. What was that? Major disaster going on? Okay. Yeah, one, one vessel that we crewed on. Uh, we went on board with the boarding officer. The captain just smiled and went down below, came up there and started counting $8,000 out of $100. And uh, the, <laughs> the boarding officer looked at us. We looked at him. And he had no choice. He arrested him for bribery. You know, it's really, you know, it's really tempting for these uh, rangers and these uh, naval people. I mean, they're making maybe $150 a month, you know, working for the government. Somebody offers them $8,000. That's a real temptation. So it's good that we're there to, to try and keep that from happening. I mean, I don't blame them. I can see, you know, see where they're coming from in that respect. But uh, the rangers, and not only the marine rangers, but the marine rangers on land in Africa do a great job in the... The, the, the fatalities that they suffer, you know, from being killed by poachers, are, you never hear about them. And that's probably, you know, you don't really hear about the dangers involved. In the last 10 years, over a thousand people have been murdered uh, for, inter, for working on environmental conservation issues in Brazil and, and Costa Rica and Africa. Over, and you don't really hear about that. How is that, how can that get solved? Uh, I mean, I think there's, you know, there's a financial incentive for some people in very poor countries to, to, to do things that are illegal and to protect that through violence. What's the solution? Well, I think that we have to have laws and we have to strictly enforce those laws. And the problem is it's, uh, it hasn't been done. So the government's really got to get up there and do it. And working with the governments that we're working with, we're getting them to be, we're getting them motivated to, uh, to understand that you know, there's going to be a lot of losses. Say you're an African right. country and you allow this to go on. Well, the money that is being made from exploiting wildlife is nothing compared to the money they're going to be losing if in tourism and, and with uh, ecological collapse and all these other things. So they have to look at the bigger picture that people may have to go without for their for other future generations to survive. You know, when everybody says, well, you know, we have to do this because we're, we're poor. Well, that's not a justification for robbing banks. It's not a justification for uh, trafficking in drugs. So why should it be a justification for, for, for trafficking in wealth? All through this conversation, we've talked about climate change. It's come up in virtually every type of thing that we've talked about. What's the solution there? What can people, what should people be doing to control climate change? Uh, by getting involved, I'm, uh, oh, two weeks ago I spoke with Greta Thunberg uh, about this, and it just shows you just what one person can do. And a 16-year-old girl, and she's getting a message all over the world. Uh, and uh, I think that the strength of this uh, movement uh, for uh, addressing climate change is coming from young people. You know, uh, the school strikes and everything, and they're, they're talking to their parents, and that's putting pressure on politicians. And, uh, and uh, they're not pulling any punches when Greta Thunberg uh, met with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. He looked out at his photo opportunity, hey, look what I'm doing. And she said, you're not doing anything. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't expect it. <laughs> well, thanks so much for talking to me today. I appreciate it. Thank you.